Did I do that right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so what do I want to talk about today? I want to talk about the Omer, but there are many different dimensions of the Omer. First of all, I'm going to say things that are very simple, because I'm not going to assume that everybody knows everything. The Omer was a carbon that was brought in the Beit HaMikdash, and it was a carbon Mincha, and it was brought on the 16th of Nisan, as the Torah calls it, Mimachras HaShabos, the day after Shabbos. And exactly. And here we have a tremendous debate between the Tukim and the Prussian, but that itself is an hour-long discussion. Yeah. So we're going to focus now on the Prussian. We'll leave out the Tukim. They'll claim that we owe them one. But for us, it's the 16th, the day after Shabbos. We're going to try to understand why the Torah is be more explicit and being clear and call this day after the beginning of Pesach and use that very ambiguous term that led to this debate. And it called it the day after Pesach. The after why is Pesach called Shabbos in this, in this context? So that's not the main point of that discussion, but we'll try to get back to that as well. I'll tell you what it is. On the page that I gave you, you'll see that the Gemara tells, oh, you didn't get that page? Okay. Do we have one more copy here? Okay. Yeah. I, I had no clue where and how to make copies, but I grabbed a couple of copies. You'll see that Tosis and Mila points out that there are two main aspects of the Omer. One is what's called Ktsiras HaOmer, and they went out and they cut the barley, they cut the Omer. The other is Havas HaOmer, which means the actual carbon. Whereas the carbon itself is brought during the day, cutting of the Omer is at night. And the Mishnah tells us in Megillah that we can categorize all mitzvahs under two different headings. One is called Mitzvah Salayla is called Mitzvah Sayom. And whenever the Torah tells us that the Mitzvah is at night, it means the entire night. From, let's say, Tzay Sakochavim, when the stars come out, until daybreak in the morning. And Ktsira Salomer, cutting the Omer, is not an exception to that rule. It requires Lila. So at night, we cut the Omer and call a Lila Ksheira with Ktsira Salomer. Now, you've all heard of Rabbeinu Tam, Rabbeinu Tam, the grandson of Rashi. Tosus in Megillah quotes Rabbeinu Tam, and he says that we have to count the Omer at night. And he says if we didn't count the Omer at night, but I'm not going to tell you what tonight's Omer is because it's getting a little late, but let's say we counted four last night. If we didn't count it at night, that's it. We've messed up. And apparently Rabbi Nutama understood that the mitzvah of Sfiras of counting the Omer, is related to Ktsiras to cutting the Omer, to the harvesting of the Omer, not to the bringing of the Omer. Then the Raman Paskins, that if he didn't count at night, he can count during the day. And the Raman in Hilchas Tmidim Umusafim writes that since the entire day is appropriate for counting the Omer, we're going to start at the earliest possible moment. Now, in halacha, when is the earliest possible moment of any yud day? At night. Because hayom halacha So that in the Jewish calendar, the day follows the night. So therefore, the rabbi wants to count the entire day, and therefore you start at night. But the rabbi says, if you didn't count at night, count during the day. Apparently, the Rambam is of the opinion that the mitzvah of counting the Omer is not dependent and not limited by Ketzirah Omer, but it applies to the entire general mechlol that we call the, the whole mitzvah of Omer, which is comprised of two parts, the bringing, the, the, excuse me, the harvesting of the Omer and the bringing of the Omer. So therefore, both night and day are included in this mitzvah. Okay, so I say that by way of introduction to answer your question. And again, night, according to our many time, is critical. Night, according to the Rambam, is only the best time to perform the mitzvah in a perfect way, meaning that you want to get the entire day included in your counting. Like Lamashal, I'll give you an example. 
uh, my son-in-law the other night uh, was, it was quite late. It was probably around 11 p.m. at night. And I asked him if he counted the Omer. And he told me he hasn't Davin Meirev yet. So he's going, you know, across the street from where we live in Harnov, we have a minion factory. And you can get a minion there at uh, one in the morning for Meirev. No problem. It's called Imre Shefer. So he was going to go to Meirev at a very late hour. But I said to him, Avi is his name, Avi, why are you delaying the counting of the Omer? You should be counting the Omer at the earliest possible time. In fact, there's one school of thought in the post who would say we should count the Omer even after Shkia, that means after sunset. Plag. Well, Plag would be B'dievet. I don't think yeah, anybody, yeah. as far as I know, there's no sheet that would advocate it to no. count it Plag. But there are opinions, and that seems to be the Vilna Gaon, for example, and the Minig of the old Tanya Shalman, to count immediately after Shkia. And don't delay. So even though you're not going to have Meirev right now, you should be counting the Omer with Shkia, with sunset. Now, from sunset to Seis HaKochom could be in Israel approximately 20 minutes. I think in Britain it's, it could be as much as 40 minutes. But the idea would be to get the, we call it a Yiddish Chaparayim, you know, make sure that you can count the entire day. So therefore you want to count as early as possible. That's why I point out to Ab. My son in law had a ha'ara. He claimed that maybe I should dive in after my, I should recount the Omer after Myra because there's a, what he called a kium tzibu, meaning that we should not count as individuals, but we should rather count as a community, as a tzibu. And therefore, our opinion, it's a very, uh, shall we say, a minority dissenting view, but the real opinion is that the Omer does not depend, the counting of the Omer does not depend upon the Tzibur, it's what we call Chovas Yochid, every individual is Chayev in counting the Omer, and why delay counting the Omer and take the outside chance that you might forget counting the Omer, it's better to count it as, as, as early as you can. Here, um, it's the earliest part of the day, you say, would be the early time to count the Omer, but that's only according to one opinion. Many other opinions, and that's what we're familiar with in Kutzler, is wait till after the Seis. Of course, in, in, in Kutzler, very rarely would they say the rest of it here. You're right. allowed. You're that's because you're here, allowed to make the brother because it's about one of them. Right here in, in, in Yerushalayim, in Eretz so Yisrael, the general, the gun, the Vilna gun had a tremendous impact. So the Minhagim are very much dependent on the, the, they reflect the opinion of the Gaon. So the Vilna Gaon was of the opinion that we should already be counting with Shkir. That's not what we're familiar with in Chutzlots. The same thing, by the way, I don't want to get off on a tangent, applied to Bdikas Chametz. And the Gaon's view was immediately with sunset. We shouldn't wait for the stars to come out. We should be Bodek Chametz. Okay, I don't want to get off on a tangent. You're, you're, so look, guru, what I want... doesn't even bring the raw. Uh, but that I don't know. <laughs> but let's let, let's not get sidetracked because I want to tell you how we can structure our time. If I'm not mistaken, Benji, we have until what about six thirty? Six twenty. Till six twenty. Great. So we have until six twenty. So here's what I'd like to do. I want to divide up our time into the following three parts. One part is: Could we bring the Omer today? Okay, that's pretty revolutionary. I don't know if anyone here advocates that we should bring the Omer today, but I want to present to you one school of thought that dates back at least 160 years ago and possibly even eight centuries ago. Okay, so that's one aspect of what I want to talk to you about. And that's why I think we may have titled the Shia tonight, Bring the Omer Today, or something along that. The second part of our discussion tonight will be to try to understand what happens in a case where I skip the day. Okay, can I continue counting with a bracha, without a bracha? And that's the second. The third dimension is what I call a little bit of hashkaf, a little bit of Jewish philosophy about the Omer in general and what does it mean to have tmimos to count the entire Omer, all 49 days. 
Okay, then, so those are the three sections. Okay. Now, the issue of whether or not we could bring the Omer, A, even though we don't have the base on Mignosh, is really a reflection of a tremendous debate that began 160 or 170 years ago when a certain Rav, I'll tell you a little bit about him, his name was Rav Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher, and there are cities in Israel that have a street named after him, Rechov Kalisher. He wrote an entire treatise. Now, just to give you a little background, he was a student of two major rabbis. Those who are in the world of, of halachic thinking will know them immediately by name, recognize them. One is Rabbi Kiva Eger, and the other is the Nesivas, the Nesivas of Rabbi Yaakov in Lisa. He was the Rav in a place called Lisa in Poland. These were his two Rebbeim. So we're not talking about someone who is outside of the Mesorah. He's very much part of the tradition of Israel. And he writes a book, and the name of the book is Drishas Sion. Right, the Gemara says in a number of places that we should be Doresh Sion, which means that Yeshayahu Anobi tells us we should think about Sion. Sion is a reference to Yushalayim, and more specifically, Isamig. So that's why he chose the title because all of his work. Before Pesach in our time. He does not mention the Omer. My name is Burzon. So Burzon is going to try to take from Reb Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher and extrapolate some sort of conclusion about the Omer. Okay, then that's going to be my, my little addition. He was one of the pioneers. Very he was good. the pioneer of a movement called Avat Zion, and they were pushing for settling in Eretz Yisrael. Now, this work has within it a, an exchange of letters between him and his Rebbe, Rebbe Kivagin, about whether or not we could bring the carbon Pesach in our time. Does that mean that we could set up a Mizbeach and we could ask a Kohen to shech the carbon and do what's called the Zriba, but we need the critical point to Zorik the Dam, sprinkle the blood on the Mizbeach, and we have the carbon Pesach. Can we do it in the absence of the Beis HaMikdash? <clears throat> so he has an amazing Chiddush, a certain Gemara in Mesech the Megillah. The Gemara tells us about a certain individual, I'll mention his name. His name is Chanyo. Oh, here it is. And this fellow Chanyo, <laughs> was in Egypt. And at the time of Chanyo, there was no base on Migdash. The first Migdash had already been destroyed. And Chanyo got permission from the local authorities in Egypt to set up a house, which is called Base Chanyo, and in this house, he brought carbonos. Now, the Gemara asks, again, I, I, this I didn't give out to you. We can always photocopy. But just to give you the, the gist of it, the Gemara says, how could he do such a thing? The only way that you could set up a Mizbeach outside of the area of the Mikdash is through something that's called a Bama, Bet Mem He, which is a private altar. Now the question is, in the absence of the Beis HaMikdash, do I have a right, is it permissible to set up a personal altar in my own backyard? In this case, Chanyo set up his own house, a structure. Inside the structure, he built an altar and he brought carbonos. So the Gemara asks, how could he do such a thing? So the Gemara answers, that Chanyo was of the opinion that Kedusha Rishona, which is the Kedusha of the Migdash that was established by David and mostly by Shlomo when he built the Migdash, 
Kidshal is shaita, v'lo kidshal yosivah. What that means is that the Mikdash has its own sanctity, but that sanctity is dependent upon the existence of the Mikdash. When the walls of the Mikdash stand, it has its sanctity. When the Mikdash is destroyed, it loses its sanctity. Now, you have to understand, before Shlomo built the base on Mikdash, we were allowed Heter Bamos to build our own personal Bama. And therefore, once Shlomo built the base on Mikdash, we can no longer bring a carbon on a Bama, on a private altar. We have to bring it in the base on Mikdash. But Chanyo was of the opinion that that's only true as long as the Mikdash stands. Once the Mikdash is destroyed, then there's no possibility of bringing a carbon in the Mikdash. Now we go back, the floodgates are open, so to speak. We go back to the situation as it existed before Shlomo Mel built the base on Mikdash, and we could bring a carbon on a Bama. And then the Gemara goes into a whole long discussion about whether or not the premise of Chanyo is correct. The Gemara quotes a dissenting view that Kedusha of Mikdash Kitsha Lashaito Vikitsha Liyosiko. That once Shlomo had built the base of Mikdash, the sanctity of the Mikdash was eternal. And it doesn't depend upon the four walls that surround the Mikdash. And even after Churban, the Makkah, the place of the Mikdash, is still sanctified. And therefore, Chanyo has no right, according to that view, of taking a Bama, taking advantage of a private altar, because Kedusha Rishon and Kitsha Lashaita Vikitsha So the Kedusha's Mikdash still exists. And therefore, Chanyo has no right to set up a bomb. Now, how do we pass him? There's a gigantic machlokis between the Rambam and the, who always argues against the Rambam, if you're familiar, the Raimund. Right? The Rambam holds that Kiddushas Migdosh, Kitshal Lashaita, Vikitshal which seems to be the final conclusion of the Gemara. However, the Raimund disagrees. And he accepts the view of Chanyo that Kitshel is shaita v'lo Kitshel Yosef. Which means that with Churban, the sanctity of the Beis HaMikdash is completely undermined, completely neutralized. So Rav Kalisher in his book wants to suggest that maybe we could bring Karbanos, like the Karban Pesach, in our time because we're going to pass in like the Ravid against the Ramah. And the Ravid holds that we pass in that Kedusha Rishon and Kitshel is shaita v'lo Kitshel Yosifah. So that with Churban, the Kedusha Beis HaMikdash is completely on the mind, completely neutralized. Hence, we can bring a Karban anywhere we want on a Bama. Imagine every single person is going to set up his own Bama and bring a Karban Pesach. Sounds like the Shomer Nim, if you know who I'm talking about. In any event, so that was Rav, Rav Rav, Hirsch, Rav Tzvi Hirsch College's first suggestion. Whoa. He got it over the head for that. And the one who took very strong opposition to him was none other than Rav Yitzchak HaKohen Kuk, Rav Avram Yitzchak HaKohen Kuk, who you may know was the first chief rabbi of Palestine. And he wrote extensively to prove that we accept the Ramav Shita against the Raivet, which means that we hold Halach HaMaisa, that Kitshel is shy to Vikitshel And therefore, there's no room for building a Bama. We don't have a Heter Bama, so we're not permitted to set up our own private altar because Kitshel is shy to Vikitshel And that's how we pass on like the Ram. And Rav Cook spends endless amount of pages to try to prove that. We don't accept the Ravid So Rav Kalisher came back and he said, wait a minute, there's good news. Why is there good news? Because if we accept the Ramam's view, that Kitshel is shaita v'kitshel that means that even after Churban, the Mokom HaMikdash, the place for the Beis HaMikdash, still has sanctity, which means that I cannot set up my own Bama, my own personal altar, but what I can do is I can set up a Mizbeach in the Mokom HaMikdash. And that's where I'm going to bring the karma. 
I, we don't have a big dosh. It doesn't matter because we're poskating that Kedusha, Kitshel Shaita Vikitshel Oslo. So even after Chorbon, after destruction, the place is still sanctified. I'll set up in his bear and then I'll bring the carbon Pesach. But my race so we'll get to that in just a minute. But before we get to the question of, of Tuma, let's just let this sink in. Tosfis in Mesech the Megillah quotes Rabbeinu Chaim HaKohen. Rav Chaim HaKohen is a very rarely quoted Bala Tosfis. He has a lot of revolutionary ideas in many different areas of Allah. Here too, it's Prishnik. Tosfis says, in the name of Rav Chaim Cohen, that if I hold, according to the mind, the Omer, low kitshel yasud lavo, then we cannot be makriv on the mizbeach, even, no, I'm sorry, because yasud lavo, we cannot be makriv on the mizbeach <laughs> because the place has no sanctity. And he writes, Rav Chaim Cohen, quoted by Tosis, li achar achurman, pokala, Kiddushas Beis Hamikdash. So the sanctity of the Beis Hamikdash is completely gone. And Tosa says that Kitcher is shown of the Kitcher Liyosin Lov. According to that opinion, he says Mokom Amizbeach. The Mokom Amizbeach li Achar Shed Nechrav Muter Lahakriv. Lahakriv. So Tosa is the following. In light of Reb Chaim Cohen, we come to the conclusion that we can be makrif karbonos in the place where the Mizbeach stood. And the reason for that is because Kedusha Rishon HaKitsha L'Shaita V'Kitsha L'Asin Lo. So in other words, this would satisfy the opinion of Rav Kook, because again, as I told you, Rav Kook said, we pass Kedusha L'Shaita V'Kitsha L'Asin Lo. So we cannot be makrif on a bomb in our personal backyard even though I got a beautiful porch, it would be a great place here in this hotel to be makrav a karbon. But we could be makrav as we set up a mizbeah. So therefore, of Kalisher, in his reformulation, he says, okay, we're not going to bring the carbon Pesach in our own personal private altar, but we'll set up an altar, a mizbeah, exactly where the mizbeah stood at the time of the Mignosh. And we're holding now that Kinshul Shaita Vinkinshul Yosin Lovah. Which means that the area of the Mikdash was sanctified eternally, even if we don't have the actual physical structure and it was destroyed, but the sanctity is still there. And therefore, we can set up a Mizbeah and bring the covenant. Mm-hmm. And in the letter that he wrote to Rabbi Kivega, Rabbi Kivega made two points. Point number one is that we're all Tmeim. If the sanctity of the Mikdash still exists, because Kitshel Ashaik of the Kitshel Yosef Lobo, we are all Tmei of excellent, we're all Tmei of Mason, and therefore we can't go into that place. How can we set up a Mizbeah? So Mikvah will work for most Tumas, for example, Tumas Zav. If a person is a Zav or a Tumas Sheretz, he came in contact with a dead a lizard of some sort. Then in a finami, he could jump into mikvah and that would be fine. But the problem is that if he came in contact with the dead body, or for example, he came in contact with someone else who came in contact, or he was in an OLMS, or he went to a funeral, etc., 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 then with regard to Tumas Mess, we need a fair para duma. We need a Zoya on the third and the seventh day. So we can never be matar ourselves from Tumas Mess without the para duma. So this was the first objection of Rabbi Kibbe. The second objection was, we need a Kohen. That's very fascinating because it could be that according to the Ravid and Chanyo that we spoke about before, the Kitshel Shait of a low Kitshel Yosidlo, which means there might be a Heter Bama, then it could be we don't Kohen on a Bama. I mean, that's a sugya at the end of Zvachim. I mean, you'd have to, you'd have to ask a genius and coach him about that. But we're not going with that Shita. We're going with the Shita that Kitshel is shot of a Kitshel Yosin Lobo, which means that we bring your carbon on a Mizbeach in a place that's sanctified, in the base of Mignish itself, even though Mignish is not standing. So here we need a Kohen. Says Rabbi Kivega, who's willing to say I'm a Kohen? 
Rabbi Kvega claims that for this need what's called a koi miyuchas. Now a koi miyuchas means that he can trace his genealogy, father, son, father, son, back to someone who served in the Mikdash at the Mizrach. <laughs> Excellent question. So the Vilna Goen, you should know, just for historical, he used to run around, he was a Bukhar, and he used to run around whenever he met a Kohen, he would be pulling himself to that Kohen, because maybe he'll find some Kohen, it would be a Miuchat. But you should know that the Rishonim say that our Kohenim today are what's called Suffolk Miuchasim. And Rabbi Kivayim gives you a long list, it's like a who's who's list, amongst the Rishonim and Poskim, that every Kohen today is considered a Suffolk. We don't know if he's Yuchas or not. He's good enough for Bidina Ben, but not good enough for... I guess, well, he's probably not going to take home, so we'll get away with him. Why do they make the Baruch Excellent question. Excellent question. Excellent question. Excellent question. So the one who answers your question was the Chassam Sofer. You may know that the Chassam Sofer was a son-in-law of Rabbi Kvega, so he was arguing here with his father. Now, no one should ever try that unless you're of some subject. Anyway, next week we have our first yard site from my father in law, maybe in the heart of Corona. In any event, so what I want to tell you is the that the some sofers that this whole business that you find sources in Rishonim and Postkin that we don't have a coin miyuchas in our day, he says, all just a chumr. It's a super duper, strict, pious application of an abstract halacha. He says, according to halacha, we have what's called a chazaka. Chazaka tells me that unless I know otherwise, I can assume a person has what's called a cheskes kashus. Every kohen says some sofa, it's a cheskes kashus, that he's a kohen kosher. We have no reason to take a coin and suspect that he's not a coin card. And says like some so fair. If you're going to go object to Rav Tzvi Hirsch College and his recommendation of bringing carbon today, then find another reason. Don't blame it on the fact that we're coin the Yuchas. And here he writes another two problems. He raises two issues. One is big day kahuna. You know that a coin in order to serve and bring a carbon has to have big day kahuna. Amongst the big day kahuna, you have to know a lot more than we know. You have to know about the alphabet and what it was made of. But there are two elements in big day kahuna that we cannot identify today. One is called tcheles, because Rashi says the tcheles in big day kahuna, like the tcheles in sits have to come from chilazon. We don't have a Mesora on Chilazon. And number two, one of the dyes, D-Y-E, is called Argaman. And we don't know what Argaman is. So therefore, the Chassam Sofer raises the problem of Big Day Kahuna. How can we bring a carbon in our time when it's we don't have the wherewithal of Big Day Kahuna? So the post -game, now you have to understand a contemporary of Tzvi Hirsch Kalisher was Ellinger. Now, you may not Orochlaner. be familiar with the name, the Arachlaner. Excellent. The Arachlaner wrote a book called the Binyan Sion. And the first four chuvas of Binyan Sion are all an analysis of this debate between Rav Tzvi Yersh and Rav Kiva Eger, those who opposed him, about bringing Karbonus Bismanes. And he comes to the conclusion that one of two things are possible. Either we can identify and Argaman, or if not, that's not Likuva. It's not absolutely critical. Now, I would add the following comment to my own list. Just by show of hands, the men here, how many of you wear Trelis? Or one person? Okay. Now, my Rebbe was Rav Salvechik. He was not into trailers. Yeah, there are plenty of good Jews who wear trailers. You have no problem. You're in good company. But those who don't wear trailers, it's probably because we're too conservative. And that's nothing to do with the movement of the conservative movement. I didn't mean that. What I meant by conservative is that 
We go by a Mesorah. We do what our parents did. You know, my Zayda didn't wear tchilis. My father didn't wear tchilis. I'm not going to wear tchilis. Okay, that's a conservative kind of view. Rav Salavich put it in halachic terms, and he said that tchilis requires Mesorah. A Mesorah means an unbroken tradition. We don't have a Mesorah on tchilis. We can try to prove it based on simonim, on indications. We may have indications that convince us a thousand percent, although the Rebzina, uh, you know, the Rebzina Rebbe, who dedicated a lot of his time to Tchelis, he came up with a different Tchelis. Rav Herzog, who was chief rabbi of, Pal- of Palestine and then the state, he had a different opinion on what Tchelis is. So I don't know if Greenspan is the last word on Tchelis, but Greenspan has done a tremendous amount of research. What's his uh, partner's name? I forget. He has a sidekick who's also a great scientist. Anyway, so that's I that's a question. question. Then. This temple in the old city is the Temple Institute that claims yeah. they're making the um, Halen mm-hmm. for the base of English. Right. Okay. So are they also involved with the trailers of the Begart information? I assume English? so, yeah. yeah. I haven't yeah. been there. I don't know. They've got everything. Yeah. Good. They've got everything. Yeah. But you know. Okay, I don't want to. I don't want to make any comments here because uh, whatever I say will be held against me. I'm not exactly sure what their angle is. Uh, yeah, I don't know that there's a mitzvah. They, they claim there's a mitzvah to create Caleb for the big. I I didn't find such a mitzvah, but maybe they have a source. But I don't know. Anyway, it's a beautiful place to visit, I suppose. But uh, so these are the issues that we have to raise over here. The first big day Kohuna, and then we have to raise the issue of Kohen Yuchas. And the issue of Kohen Yuchas was already addressed, as we said before, by the Chassam Sofer. So then according to Chassam Sofer, we could take that off our list of problems. We have an objection because of Big Day Kuhuna. And the Binyan Sion claims, that's Rav Etlinger, the Orchlander, he claims that we can come up with Big Day Kuhuna. It's not, it's not an issue. Even if we're not 100% sure, we can certainly be marker of the Karman based on Big Day Kuhuna. Another issue, however, and this becomes very relevant to my jump because I want to apply all this to the carbon minimum owner. Is the issue of shkolim? I don't know how many people are into dafyomi. We'll have dafyomi shi here tomorrow. I know we had dafyomi uh, the last couple of days. We'll try to continue that tradition. And in shkolim, it says that a carbon sibur, right? We have two categories of carbonos. We have private carbonos and public carbonos, so a communal carbon. Communal carbon has to come from the funds of what's called the Shumas Halishka. This is the shkolim that were collected from all members of Kal Yisrael. It's all issue about women, whether women are obligated in shkolim or not. But certainly if a woman would come forward with her shkolim, we would accept them. And then we go and we buy a carbon zebra from these funds. And the later postkin, this is already in the 20th century, they say, how could we bring a carbon bismanenu if it's a carbon seaboard? We don't have shkola. We don't have a collection of shkola. So I was fascinated because many of the post argue that we have a principle in our locker called zachin li adam shalom b'fanu. What that means is that I can take ownership over an object on your behalf if it's positive. Again, if it's a rabid dog, I don't know if that's a good idea, but if it's something that's worth something and nobody would argue that it's a schus, it's in your favor and your merit, then I can make a Kenyan and I could acquire ownership on your behalf, even if you didn't appoint me as your agent. So therefore the post can say that there's no problem with shkolen. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have someone grab a bunch of shkolen and he's going to say, I am hereby acquiring ownership on these shkolim on behalf of the entire community of Israel. And then we're going to use those shkolim to buy a carbon sibu. Now, the Minchas HaOmer is a classic case of a carbon sibu. But if we've solved the problem of shkolim, then we're okay. Because we now can purchase a carbon sibu from funds that are owned by the sibu through the principle of Zoch and the other shalom. How- just, just give me one more minute because I'm, I'm going to lose my trend. And here's the punchline. Again, the punchline of it all is meaning. Let's go back to the beginning. Rabbi Kivega said that we have a problem because of Tamei Mason. 
that we all have been contaminated through a corpse. <coughs> and therefore, you can't go into a Mokam Kadosh. We can't enter the site of the Mikdash when we're in a state of Tuma. So if Tzvi Hirsh Kalash said to his Rebbe, to Rebbe Kibbe, what are you talking about? I want to bring a Karban Sibu. Like, for example, Karban Pesach. Now, again, you know, if we were great geniuses and scholars, we'd have to analyze whether Karban Pesach is really a Karban Sibu or not. In fact, the, the greatest proof that it's not a Karban Sibu is the fact that we don't have to purchase a Karban Pesach from Shkol. Right? There's no such thing as using the Trumas Halishka to buy Karban Pesach. So that itself is ipso facto a proof that it's not a Karban Sibu. But in any event, we apply the principle that we override Tumor if most of the tzibur are tmeim, then we will bring a carbon pesach. In fact, that principle applies not just to carbon pesach, but to any carbon tzibur, including the minchas haomer. So, if we have a situation in which most of the people of Israel have been contaminated with Thomas mess, we could bring the carbon even without taro, without purifying ourselves simply because of Tuma. Now, again, whether it's Tuma Hucho B'tzibur or Tuma Tuchuya B'tzibur, that's a whole different issue. But either way, the Rama happens to pass in the Tuma is the Chuya B'tzibur. So you might ask me, so why should we bring the Minchas HaOmer? I'm going to tell you why I think we should bring the Minchas HaOmer. Even if you hold like the Rama and the Tuma is only the Chuya B'tzibur. Because we need the Omer to be matir, what's called chadash. You know how now you do that. <laughs> what do you say? The Allah had nowadays, before that production of Yochan and Zakai, from the very, from sunrise, we can already eat chadash. Great, that's totally in the open. That's in the tuition, you know, even without the carbon over. But, but I, I, I still if don't. We, if we brought over, you'd have to wait another six hours or something. Right, so right. I, but I don't think, I don't think this is relevant. I'll tell you why. Because the very fact that Bisman Shem Mikdash Kayam, when the Mikdash stood, we would bring the Omer in order to be Matir Chadash, right? The Mishnah says in Mesech the Menachas, Daf Samach Vav, Samach Ches, wherever it is, it says, Omer Hoya Matir Be Medina, Bishteh Lechem Be Mikdash. So the Mishnah is outspoken about the fact that the Omer itself is Matir Chadash. Maybe a difference of six hours, whatever it is, but the Mishnah says, you can't deny it, that the Omer is Matir Chadash, that that which we couldn't eat from the new crops, we can only eat after the Omer is brought. That itself should be enough of a reason to bring the Omer. That's what I was saying, the Mora says, I doubt that there is no Mikdash. We do so we get from sunrise. From sunrise, we get away. So I'm, I'm doing good. I'm doing great. Right, but, but I'm going to gain another 12 hours of, what? of the Heter Omer, because oh. once I do the Ketzira, that itself would. Well, yeah, you're right. I, I need the half off. You're right. I have to wait till daybreak. But in any event, this would be this would be an argument of whether or not we would be overriding Tuma as we do in the case of any carbon but for the sake of Minchas, Minchas Om. But in my mind, the only outstanding issue is Big Day Kuhu. Now, just to conclude this discussion, because I want to use how are we doing on the clock? Or oh, we don't have that much time. I want to conclude this discussion by mentioning another letter that Rabbi Kivega sent to Rabbi Tzvi Hirsh Kalash, to his, his disciple. And that is the Makom HaMizbeha. There's a passage which the Gemara quotes very frequently throughout Shas from Dibre Yom that indicates that the Mizbeah has to be located in a very exact location. And Rabbi Kivega says that we have different shitos about what the Amma is, right? The Amma is a measurement. So when we measure different areas, west and east and north and south, to figure out exactly where the location of the Mizbeach is, who's going to tell us exactly where the Mizbeach is located? And based on this argument, he comes to the conclusion that we need both a Navi, a prophet in Israel, and Sanhedrin, which is another issue is whether or not we can set up the sun engine in our time in order to pass in and determine exactly where is the Mokam of his bear. And this is, as a result of this letter of Rabbi Kvega, an entire literature, mushrooms, around the question of what is an Amma? Can we know what an Amma is? Now, for those of you who may know, 
there's a gigantic debate between Reb Chaim Noah and the Chazanish, exactly what an Amma is. And the question is, can we establish a tradition, let's say, for example, like Reb Chaim Noah against the Chazanish, and decide what the Amma is, and then since we know where the Kodesh Kedoshim is, by the way, how do we know where the Kodesh Kedoshim is today? Because we have the Eben HaShesiyah. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have it yet. But <laughs> they have it. <laughs> but uh, the Eben HaShesiyah is there. So we know exactly where the Avodas Kohen Gadol was on Yom Kippur, on the holiest days. And from that area, we can determine exactly where the Mizbeach is. So there's a whole slew of posts, given I would say even the majority view, that we can figure out today where to put the Mizbeach. And we come up to what's called Horas Din. Horas Din means that whenever you have an issue in halacha, we have a mechanism by which we come to some conclusion. We pass in halacha. And we're going to operate within the Horas Din. And we're going to come to a conclusion exactly where to set up the Mizbeach. But the only problem that I have personally, and if I could solve this problem, then I'm wondering if we should... By the way, how many... Do we have anyone here who has a little bit of a Belzer background? My wife is a Belzer. Direct. So Rabbi Arla Belza, who my, my father in the peace, was very close to Rabbi Arla, he, re- he would run away from Yushalayim during Pesach because he felt that we should be bringing the carbon Pesach in our time. So he wanted to be what's called the Rechuk Makal, and therefore he's exempt from the mitzvah of carbon Pesach. I'm just giving you a, a shakaru why you shouldn't think. You know, sometimes we... <laughs> Again, I shouldn't say this, so cross it off the official recording, but sometimes we tend to attribute certain piskei alocha to politics. Maybe there is a basis for that, but not in this case. This machlokas about whether we should be bringing the carbon Pesach in our time is a pure, unadulterated halachic issue with many different dimensions to it. This has nothing to do with Zionism. I don't care if you're pro-Zionism, if you're anti-Zionism. I don't care what color kippa you wear and what flag you wave. It's irrelevant. This is a halachic issue that spans and 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 crosses all political, uh, you know, uh, territories. So therefore, my issue personally, again, I'm not trying to be prejudiced, prejudice you, but I have questions about big day kuhuna. I'm not sure if we can be definite about big day kuhuna bizman and by the way, if a Kohen does the Avodah without Big Day Kuhunis, Misa Big Day that's a pretty severe violation. So I wouldn't want to be the first Kohen to volunteer to wear the Big Day Kuhun and, not know, and do the Avodah, not knowing whether I'm wearing the right book. I have a simple question. The opinion, what's it, Chonia, what's his name? Yeah. If the king is correct, why wasn't it brought? The Rabbi Akiva was after the Chorban. Only a couple of thousand years. Our forefathers didn't bring it. So if, that's if not. Was writing, they would have. So that's not true. No. I'm going to shock you again. Okay. <laughs> Here's a real shock for you. You know that five centuries ago, we had a brilliant fellow by the name we know him as the Yaivitz or Yaakov M. Okay, that's a a very interesting historical period of time in his relationship with Rabbi Yonis and Ibrish. But in any event. Rav Yaakov Emden, not only that, but even the Ratz Chayas, who was a younger contemporary, so we're going back 500 years, he writes that the Gemara Sachem tells us that Rav Gamliel brought the carbon Pesach. In fact, there are many halachas of carbon Pesach that we derive from Rav Gamliel. Rav Gamliel actually lived after the Churma, and yet he brought the carbon Pesach. Furthermore, Rav Yehuda ben Becerra, the Gemara says, brought a carbon Pesach. He too was after the Churban of Bites. Well, but here's know. the most radical thing. Where did they do it? Where? They did it in the Mokum Amigdash, in the, in the Mizbeach. And I'll tell you something else. This is also way out. One of the Baliatoskas, he lived seven centuries ago in the 1300s. His name is Rabbi Chilmi Paris. And his Talmud was named Farchi. If you know any Syrians, any Chalabim by the name of Farchi, they no doubt descend from the kafta of a ferret. That was his magnum opus. So he writes about his Rebbe, Rabbi Chil Paris, that Rabbi Chil Paris had packed his bags to go to Yushalayim to bring the carbon Pesach in the year 1360. 
This is after the Chorban. I don't have to tell you, right? And he says that he's not sure exactly why at the end of the day, Rabbi Yechiel didn't actually bring the Korban Pesach. He indicates in his writings, if we had time we go through them inside, that there was a certain tirda. Tirda means that he, he, was, he was preoccupied. Something went wrong. You know, this is not long after the Burning crusades. Of the 24, yeah. Truckloads, what was it? The truckloads, yeah, in uh, Paris. Uh, you remember that? We have uh, we feel with Paris. right? We have the, 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 the Kino, the Kino on yeah. Tisha B'Av of uh, around the Gutenberg. What's the name of the Kino? Okay, it'll come back to me anyway. Bottom line is Charlie Sufa Base, excellent. Charlie Sufa, thank you so much. Charlie Sufa Base, yeah. Now. The Kafta of Ferach, and with this I want to conclude because we don't have that much time, and, and I want to add a few other things on a different time. The Kafta of Ferach writes that, that although his Rebbe was on the way to bring the Korban Pesach, he says that I also, just one second, I want to read his language to you, if I can find it here, just one second. Give me a second, sorry, I apologize. I don't want to misquote you. Oh. He says, as far as Tumas Mess is concerned, he says, Tumas Mess Nidres. He has no problem. That's not his issue. However, he says, you know what bothers my mind? He's not sure about Koin Miyuchas. Now, watch what's going on here. This is four centuries or three and change before Rebbe Kivega. And and Rav Farchi is already claiming that we, we might not be able to bring the Korban Pesach because we don't have a Korban Miyuchas. He has no other problem. Meaning that as far as Tum is concerned, he doesn't see an issue. He doesn't mention a word about Big Day Kona, and I don't think he knew more about Big Day Kona than we do. We probably know more than he did in the modern research. If you, again, if you don't need a tradition, if you just can prove it with Simon. So I just want to leave you with this food for thought that it could very well be that we could bring the carbon over. My hesitation is big day kahuna, but the farchi doesn't seem to be bothered after the farchi at all. Now, if you have, for those of you who may have gotten this page, so we mentioned the issue of someone who skipped a day of the omer. And here I find something absolutely fascinating which you'll see here on the page. This is paragraph number one, two, three, four, five. Fifth paragraph down. And he's quoting a Tosis in Minotus. Posak bahag ba'al lochas gedolos, paskin, shem hifsik yom echod, velo sofar. He missed a day and he didn't count it. Shuv eno sofer. He cannot count any more days. We need all 49 days. And Tosa's comments, Tosa says this is absolutely unacceptable. It's not reasonable. By the way, if I sit down, will you still see me? Okay. Now, the simple interpretation, classic, if you would stop any yeshiva book and ask him, what's this all about? I skipped the day of the Omer. Can I continue counting or not? He will tell you the following. And he's quoting the Sefer Achinuch, also from the Rishonim. Yeah. That it all depends on the 49 independent mitzvahs, and every day is a separate mitzvah. Or is there one mitzvah to count 49 days? You're all familiar with that. I mean, that's pretty classic. My Rebbe Rav Soloveitchik said no. He said... 
Everybody agrees that every day of the Omer is a separate independent day and every day generates a chiv of counting the Omer. And the proof of the pudding, I would add in a footnote, my own name, is that we make a bracha on every day. So why then would the Bahag say that if I miss the day, that's it? If, if every single day is an independent mitzvah, what's the problem? So if Salvation said the problem, that the definition of sphere of counting requires continuity. For example, let's say, okay, let's say tonight was the fourth day of the Omer. It's not, right? But if I didn't count yesterday as the third day of the Omer, I went from two to four and I skipped a day, then what do you mean it's the fourth day of the Omer? You never told me you never counted the third day of the Omer. So the Eitzar Hashem, I found an ancient manuscript that was published of the Sefer Achina. And it has certain texts that we don't have in the Sefer Achim. And he writes that if a person missed the day of the Omer, he should declare emesh hayakach v'kach, vayomu kach v'kach. He should count yesterday and then go on to count today. If this be the case, then according to this text and this version, the Sefer Achim, it could be possible that everybody agrees that every day is a separate independent mitzvah, but I need what's called in Hebrew, hem shechiyut. I need continuity. I can't count tonight if I didn't count yesterday. Comes along the Sefer Achinuch to explain the sheet of Tosus. Tosus says, Fitema, in that we should be able to continue counting despite the fact that we missed a day. And he says, yeah, you'll count yesterday. Now, I don't know what he would say if I only woke up on the 49th day. <laughs> can I count the first 48? I don't know. You know, how, how far? Can I count two days that I missed? I don't know. But certainly if I missed one day, I could count yesterday. So if I were to play checkers and I miss every other day, I could still be on the, on the board because I would say that yesterday was so-and-so and today was so-and-so. So now we have a whole new machlokas, a whole new perspective on what the debate is all about. Everybody agrees there was never an issue that there are 49 separate independent mitzvahs, but what is the mitzvah? That mitzvah is dependent upon the continuity. So now the question is the following, and with this we'll, we'll conclude. If you take a look at the top of your page, page one, so to speak, You'll see the following. Tosis quotes Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbeinu Tam says, if you didn't count at night, that's it. You can't count during the day. That's Tosis in the Sechta Megillah. But if you fast forward two paragraphs, the third paragraph, Tosis of Menachah says, V'hecha deshochach lispar balayla, posak bal halochet kedolos, shesofer bayom. Okay, then, so Rabbi Nitam says that we cannot count during the day. We can only count at night. As we said at the outset, if those of you who are with me, that according to Rabbi Nitam, it needs us to count from the Ketzira song, which could only be at night, not from the Avar song. On the other hand, Tosis says, in the name of the Baha'i, that if you forgot to count at night, he counts during the day. Now, something very odd is going on over here. The Baha'i says, if I miss the day, i.e. 24 hours, then I cannot continue counting. And yet, the Bahag says that if I missed at night, I can count during the day. Does the Bahag mean to say, like the Rambam, that the mitzvah includes not just the Zman of Ketzir HaSomer, but also the Zman of Havah And Tosis elsewhere, not in Menachas, quotes the Bahag as saying that he should count without a bracha. Now, I don't understand. Mimonav Shach, as we say, no matter how you split the cake, if he holds like Rabbeinu Tam and the mitzvahs to count at night because of Ketzirah Sober, then why would he count during the day? It's meaningless. If on the other hand he holds that, like the Ram Shita, that the mitzvah is both during the time of the Ketzirah and during the time of the Avo, which means both night and day, then he should be making a bracha. What's this twilight zone where I'm going to count during the day without a bracha? And I believe we have the answer. Why? Because the Bahag holds, like Rabbeinu Tam, the mitzvahs at night. You cannot count with a bracha during the day. But 
We need the counting during the day. Because that counting during the day would allow me to count the next day in order to set up my continuity. So if you accept Rav Salvechik's Chiddush here as insight, then everybody agrees there are 49 separate mitzvahs, but the issue is, can I count today when I skipped yesterday? So that even if it's an independent mitzvah, but the mitzvah is counting, and I can't count it if I didn't continue the counting. But comes along the Baha'i, and he says that if I miss counting at night, well, as far as the key my mitzvah is concerned, I cannot fulfill my mitzvah during the day, but I will count during the day. And what goal do I achieve by counting during the day? The day itself becomes safur. Safur means it counted. And then tomorrow, I can count the Just to conclude with one quick, very quick thought. The idea of the Omer, according to everyone, is to lead up to Kabbalah Satoh. The 50th day is the day in which we receive it. Every day we should be achieving a little bit more, climbing, ascending the ladder, and working on the Midos, the Bali Kabbalah tell you on, which Mida to work on in each particular day. And ultimately, what we're going to count is the number 49. Now, which is great, one or 49? 49 is great. Because every day we're adding another day. And I think that what's critical here is that we be proud of ourselves. And how do we get pride in ourselves by achieving one day after the other and realizing that we're building towards the climax, towards the apex, towards the pinnacle, which is Kabbalah Satan. And that's why I believe the halacha says in Shulchan Aruch, you have to count Be'amida when you stand. When a person is proud of their achievements and they want to feel good, what's called in Mishlei, Gavol Libi B'dark Hashem, then they should be standing. So Yerot Salmibi is will that we should all stand, count the Omer, and on every successive night, we should feel that continuity as we're building and building to the apex of Kabbalah Satoru. At the end of the day. Thank you, Rosh Hashem. And we're very excited to have our brothers stay. Shabbos and Shri Shabbos. 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 Oh. Just, uh, just here yes, sure. 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 So I'm aware that there's a group near between and claims that they have found the Khilazon and so have found the uh, They they claim they found the Khilazon. Is it the same as as uh, 